What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and I have a very exciting announcement to make. We finally have some merchandise. You heard that right. It's long overdue, but we just dropped our first messed up origins line and a series of what I like to call messed up emblems. These are totally original designs inspired by your favorite messed up stories. I worked with a very talented artist named Sketchadoodle to make these and we had a lot of fun doing it. My goal was to have some goods that were emblematic of our favorite fairy tales, but not dripping in fairy dust if you know what I mean. You might be thinking it would have been a good idea to have a Lion King design made since I'm announcing it in a Lion King video, but that was foresight I didn't have. The good news is if you like series one and they sell well, you can bet we'll be making series two based off your suggestions. So if you got them, comment them down below. And now we move on past the shameless self promo to discuss what we came here to discuss, the origins of the Lion King, which I can almost guarantee are far more complicated than you thought, being that it's Disney's first original story. You see, back in January, I ran a poll to see what movie's origins you wanted me to cover more, Anastasia or The Lion King? And to my surprise, Anastasia won. The results were very close, but many of you said that you already knew that Lion King was based on Hamlet and you wanted to hear something new. Well, what if I told you that it's actually not based on Hamlet at all and the few similarities between them are more coincidence than anything? <laughs> Made that up. I'm not making it up, man. That's straight from the mouth of the movie's first producer, Tom Schumacher, a man who oversaw its creation from its earliest days as a film about a territory conflict between lions and baboons. He said the story was inspired by the far more ancient tales of Ben-Hur, King Arthur, and even Joseph and Moses from the Old Testament, and the commonalities with Hamlet were more of an afterthought. In other words, it wasn't until well after production began that someone made the observation about its similarities with the play. And people were like, oh yeah, that is really similar similar to one of the most famous written works of all time. What a coincidence, and just rolled with it. Now, some of you might have a hard time believing that, especially if you're familiar with the Kimba controversy. That being said, I kind of believe it's a coincidence because when you really analyze the elements they have in common, they play out very differently. Regardless of what the right answer is, because that belief is so commonly held, I still wanna do a breakdown of Hamlet so you guys can see where the stories overlap and then where they diverge from each other. Then we'll talk about some of the other stories the movie is based on or allegedly based on and how so many legendary tales have so much in common. But first, let's do a recap of The Lion King for those who haven't seen it in a while and may have forgotten some things. As always, don't forget to smash that like button so we can reach our goal of 10,000 likes this week and subscribe and ring that bell to have new videos just like this delivered to your sub box on a regular basis. The movie opens with one of the most gorgeous pieces of animation ever made. The sun is rising over the Sahara and the animals gather around Pride Rock to welcome King Mufasa's son, our main character Simba, into the world. We follow Simba throughout his childhood and watch as he learns about the world around him, sometimes from his father and sometimes by directly disobeying his father. While Simba's out there living his best life, his uncle Scar, Mufasa's brother, is devising a plan to kill the king and take his throne. One day, Scar leads Simba down into a gorge while his hyena homies lead a mindless stampede of the beasts in his direction. Scar runs to Mufasa, feigning concern for Simba's safety, but this is all part of his plan. Mufasa manages to navigate his way through the stampede and save his only son, but on his way back up the cliff, he's betrayed by his brother and falls to his death below. When Simba discovers his lifeless body, good old Uncle Scar is there to make him feel as responsible as possible and tells the prince he has to leave the kingdom for good. Simba doesn't know any better, so he does what Scar says, and while he almost ends up killing himself, the good-natured Jagaloons, Timon and Pumbaa, stumble upon him and take him in as one of their own. He learns the ways of the Jagaloon in no time, and we see him grow up into the most pathetic version of a king you can possibly imagine. One day, he has to save Pumbaa from being eaten by his old friend Nala, and when she ends up pinning him, they recognize each other. Nala tells Simba the kingdom is falling apart, and it's his duty to take back the throne and restore order. But his easygoing life just hasn't prepared him for such a task, and he tells her he can't do it, much to her disappointment and disgust. Soon after, the hopeless prince encounters his father's old friend, the shaman Rafiki. He leads him into reuniting with Mufasa's spirit, who then tells him he must take his rightful place as king, and the young lion finally accepts his destiny. He returns to Pride Rock just in time to see Scar give his mom a smack, and when Simba confronts him, the evil king turns the tables and backs him to the edge of the cliff where he reveals that Mufasa's death was by his own design. This fuels Simba's rage, and he lunges at his uncle, pinning him and forcing him to reveal the truth to the rest of the pack. A fight breaks out between the lions and hyenas, with the lions coming out on top, and Simba tossing Scar off the cliff when he refused to 
exile. In one of the most gruesome moments in a Disney film, Scar is torn apart by his former allies while Simba ascends to his rightful place at the head of Pride Rock. Rain falls, the Pride Lands are restored to their former glory, and our story ends with the birth of Simba and Nala's daughter. You see what they did there? It's the circle of life. In all seriousness, how good is that movie? And as popular as it is, I really don't think it gets the credit it deserves for its original story because seemingly everyone thinks it was inspired by Shakespeare's Hamlet. I can see why because they have quite a few things in common, and we've even covered stories and movies in the past that had even less in common with their source material. But as we unpack this tragedy, I'm hoping you'll see how different they are at a fundamental level. For those unfamiliar with Hamlet and why it's gotten a reputation for being the original Lion King, here's a brief overview. The story follows Prince Hamlet, whose father, the King of Denmark, has just died unexpectedly. Hamlet is deeply troubled by this loss, and what's more is that his father's brother, Uncle Claudius, has taken over the throne and married the widowed queen. One fateful night, the prince is visited by his father's ghost, who reveals that Uncle Claudius was his murderer and orders Hamlet to avenge his death. So at this point, it sounds pretty similar to Lion King. Murdered king, brother takes the throne, and at one point, Hamlet's even exiled just like Simba is. However, that is where the similarities end, and even those play out very differently than in the movie. So let's get into specifics. For starters, Hamlet is 30 and well into his adult life when his father is murdered. So the fundamental theme of Lion King, which is the embracing of responsibility as one enters adulthood, is non-existent in this play. As a result, Hamlet avenging his father's death has a completely different motive. Because remember, when Mufasa visits Simba, he doesn't say, Scar is the one who killed me. You must get revenge. He says, you could be so much more than what you've become. Take your place in the circle of life and Simba avenges him in the process of fulfilling his own destiny. There's a deep metaphor in there about honoring your family and the sacrifices they made for you by facing the world head on and doing the most with your life that you can. Simba's exile is what motivated him to do just that because doing the opposite left him feeling miserable and empty. I will say that both princes' exiles started out the same way as plans for their uncles to low-key murder them, but Hamlet doesn't do any learning or growing during his time outside the kingdom. He just outsmarts his captors, survives execution, and comes back. It's also worth mentioning that in the play, Claudius feels immense guilt over killing his brother, something Scar doesn't struggle with at all. In fact, I'd bet he'd kill Mufasa again just for fun. Simba and Hamlet do both have love interests, but Hamlet's girl Ophelia ends up offing herself after Hamlet accidentally kills her father Polonius when he catches him eavesdropping behind a curtain. Imagine if in the process of killing Scar, Simba accidentally killed Nala's dad, Nala committed suicide, and then her brother wanted to take revenge on Simba. It'd be a totally different story, right? That's what I'm saying. Now when it comes to the ending, total chaos and nothing like the Lion King. Hamlet ends up dueling Ophelia's brother Laertes, who's secretly using a poison sword and manages to infect both Hamlet and himself, thereby sealing their fates. King Claudius watches from his throne, ready to offer Hamlet a goblet of poisoned wine should he survive. But the queen ends up drinking it, despite specifically being told not to, and dies instead. When Hamlet sees his mother killed, he's overcome with rage and stabs Claudius through the chest while pouring what's left of the poisoned wine down his throat. The prince and Laertes make peace on their deathbeds, and shortly after they die, the Norwegian army invades and are given control of the kingdom. So by the end of the play, all the main characters are killed, and most of the side characters are killed. No lessons are learned, and no one is happy with how the conflict ends, except for probably the Norwegians. And I think that's why I can't get totally on board with the inspired by Hamlet claim. When you look at the hero characters' journeys as a whole, they tell two very different stories. One is about how greed and thirst for revenge can lead to your entire world ending, and the other is about embracing responsibility and developing into the best version of what you could be. And the other reason I'm torn on this issue is because the similarities that Lion King shares with Hamlet, it shares with a lot of other stories, and that's because it's a movie that's built on archetypes. We've talked a little about archetypes on this channel before. By now, many of you are familiar with the Arne Thompson Tale Type Index, the official system used to classify folktales. They use recurring motifs and themes, also known as archetypes, to organize stories with similar elements. For example, Chicken Little is of type 20C, the end of the world, while Hansel and Gretel is type 327A, the children and the witch. Well, what if I told you that we can go even broader and classify not only fables, but basically every famous story you can think of into a grand total of seven basic archetypes. They are as follows. Overcoming the monster, rags to riches, voyage and return, comedy, tragedy, rebirth, 
and the one we're focusing on today, the quest. In his book, The Seven Basic Plots, Chris Booker had this to say about the quest. Far away, we learn there is some priceless goal worth any effort to achieve, a treasure, a promised land, something of infinite value. From the moment the hero learns of this prize, the need to set out on the long, hazardous journey to reach it becomes the most important thing to him in the world. Whatever perils and diversions lie in wait on the way, the story is shaped by that one overriding imperative, and the story remains unresolved until the objective has been finally, triumphantly secured. Two of my favorite examples of the quest are Lord of the Rings and the Odyssey, but another is Lion King. And I want to break down for you how it fits in that category, and then how Hamlet flips the category on its head. So in Lion King, that something of infinite value is Simba taking his rightful place as the King of Pride Rock, and the quest is his journey from birth to throne. On that journey, he encounters a variety of obstacles that are typical of the quest hero. Monsters like Scar and the Hyenas, temptations like living the easy life with Timon and Pumbaa, and a metaphorical journey to the underworld where he faces the insecurities that lie within his tangled unconscious and consults the spirit of his father for guidance. We're made aware of the presence and importance of his companions who play a significant role on his quest. Wow! If you're hungry for a hunk of fat and juicy meat, even assisted by a form of wise man. The basic quest story typically unfolds through a series of stages, which Lion King also follows. The call to adventure, where Simba learns from Mufasa that he'll be king someday. The journey, after Mufasa dies. The arrival and frustration, when he returns to Pride Rock and sees it's a wasteland. The final ordeal, where he defeats Scar. And the attainment of his ultimate goal, when he becomes the king of Pride Rock, with the assurance of renewed prosperity stretching indefinitely into the future. So our hero answers the call to adventure. His medal is put to the test and with the help of some friends and a wise man, he comes out on top, a more complete being. Such is also the structure of the many stories that Lion King's writers cited as inspiration for the movie, including King Arthur and Ben-Hur. Like Simba, King Arthur also was raised outside his kingdom, but when his father dies and leaves an empty throne, it's up to him to prove he's the rightful heir. He does so by famously pulling the sword from the stone, the start of his adventure, and defeating his many enemies with the Knights of the Round Table by his side, as well as the guidance of the wise old man Merlin. In Ben-Hur, the Jewish Prince Judah is framed by his own best friend of trying to assassinate the emperor solely because they have political and religious disagreements. His mom and sister are imprisoned and he's sold into slavery, but through hard work, he manages to rise above every obstacle in his path, with the help of some friends, of course, and goes on to help free them and restore honor to his name. These are the formulas that Lion King followed, not Hamlet's, where instead of witnessing his transcendence, we follow the prince's descent into darkness. Fundamentally, they're opposites, but that leaves us with the question, why the overlap? Well, that question is pretty easy to answer, actually, it's because Hamlet was inspired by a Scandinavian folktale written 500 years earlier. It was called Amleth, or Hamlet with the H at the end, and it actually does follow the quest archetype. Like Hamlet, Amleth also follows a prince on his quest for revenge against his conniving uncle, who killed his father, took the throne, and married his mother. Amleth also pretends to be crazy to avoid looking like a threat to his uncle while he secretly crafts a plan to kill him. He also kills an eavesdropper, who this time is hiding in a bale of hay, and he even escapes execution in the same exact way. The key difference between the two is that Amleth is a confident young lad who is so convinced of his uncle's malevolent intentions, he doesn't waver from his mission to kill him, where Hamlet hesitates every chance he gets. As a result of his extreme focus, not only does he succeed in killing his uncle, he also kills his uncle's loyal followers by inviting them to a feast, getting them all so drunk they pass out, and then burning down the building they pass out in. And just like that, the archetypal tale of the young hero whose light father is replaced by his dark father, whom he eventually slays to become king is complete. That's the story Shakespeare chose to adapt in the darkest possible way, essentially turning it upside down. And it's that same kind of story, that same archetypal structure that Lion King's writers were thinking of when they wrote their original tale. Wait, did I say original tale? Because I know there's some people yelling at their screens right now going, Kimba, Kimba, what about Kimba? So let's talk about Kimba. Kimba the White Lion is an extremely popular character from Japan. He was thought up by the creator of Astro Boy, Osamu Tezuka, in 1950, who featured him in a comic called Jungle Emperor that went on to become an anime in 1965 and broadcast in America the following year. If it's not obvious, the reason we're talking about Kimba is because his story has a lot in common with our pal Simba's and was written almost 50 years earlier. They're both lion princes who have to reclaim their father's throne after he's killed. They're both guided back home by by the spirits of their parents, and they both have to take out a shadowy usurper with an eye injury. When Lion King was released in 1994, it was heavily marketed as Disney's first original story. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner, head of the Walt Disney Company. The Lion King is unique. 
Unlike our other Disney animated features, The Lion King is not based on any previously published fairy tale or literary work. It's an original concept that was developed in the story department of Disney Animation. And while the Americans they were marketing to didn't know enough to question it, Japanese audiences were raising their eyebrows. On top of the similarities I just listed, both properties had spazzy bird characters, wise baboon characters, and hyenas that were allies to the antagonists. When Disney was first called out about it, they denied that anyone on their Lion King team knew anything about Kimba, but that doesn't appear to be true. For starters, Tezuka was a huge fan of Walt Disney's and adapted both Pinocchio and Bambi into mangas in 1951 and even met the man himself at the New York World's Fair in 1964. Both men excelled in the same field, were incredibly famous in their home countries, and even had licensing agreements between their studios. So it's undeniable that someone at Disney knew who Tezuka was and probably who Kimba was since he was one of Tezuka's two most famous characters. Another obvious similarity is that both Kimba and Sim Simba sound incredibly similar, but that one you can actually justify because Simba is Swahili for lion. Obviously, Tezuka was aware of this and he changed the first letter, probably because it made it more of a name instead of just being a word. One of Lion King's directors, Roger Aller, said he didn't know who Kimba was until the end of production, but Allers lived in Tokyo, Japan, working in animation in the 80s. Therefore, it's highly unlikely that he went that whole time without seeing or hearing of Kimba. Matthew Broderick said that when he was first cast as Simba, he told people he was playing Kimba and what may be the most damning evidence of all is that Roy Disney himself referred to Simba as Kimba in a 1993 interview. It's also worth mentioning that Lion King didn't start production until 1989, the same year that Kimba's creator died. I'll admit this one might just be a coincidence because the original Lion King plot was wildly different than the one that we know, but it's too suspect not to mention. Now, if you're wondering why Tezuka Studio didn't do anything about the supposed ripoff, they actually commented on the matter saying, we're a small, weak company. It wouldn't be worth it anyway. Disney's lawyers are among the top 20 in the world. In other words, they were the little guy, and if they put up a fight, they probably would have lost. As someone who's also had his content ripped off by Corporate Giant, I feel for them. One asterisk I want to point out, though, is that Tezuka openly admitted that Kimba was inspired by Disney's Bambi. Another story about an animal prince whose well-being is threatened by humans and then goes on to become king of his territory. That obviously doesn't justify the alleged theft. I'm just saying that that might be the straw that Disney's employees are grasping at to help them sleep at night. And it's with that, Solo fam, that we end today's episode of Messed Up Origins. What do you think? I'll admit, this is probably the most challenging video I've done so far. It's surprisingly hard to break down the origins of an original film, especially when there's so much misinformation out there to confuse people. When it comes down to it, though, it can all be boiled down to archetypes. Speaking of, what do you think of a mini-series where I break down these seven basic archetypes and list some famous examples? Let me know your thoughts on that idea and anything we talked about today in the comment section down below. If you would be so kind as to smash that like button. It would really mean a lot to me and the whole Solo fam. If you haven't joined our family yet, just subscribe and ring that bell to have notifications sent straight to your phone whenever I upload. As always, the links to my social medias can be found in the description as well as the handles right in front of you. Follow me on any of those to stay updated on what I'm doing between videos, what projects I'm working on next, including hints at the next Origins episodes, and of course, just to say what's good. Don't forget to check out our merch too because I'm going to be announcing it in its own video coming soon and I'm going to want pictures of you guys rocking it. If not for that video specifically, then to feature at the end of another Messed Up Origins episode. Thank you all so much for watching and for your continued support. I'll be seeing you next week. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.